Hi, I'm Liam Neer from CKTV. I'm at the Opera House for the Dangerous Ideas Conference, where people will express their opinions about today's social issues. These issues will not only affect me, but will also affect you. If you want peace, forget justice. Let us debate in the Dangerous Ideas Conference. Without Nelson Mandela and his EOS for Forgiveness, South Africa could not have come to an end without a bloodbath. Our panel will discuss some of the most well-known conflicts of our time, Northern Ireland, East Timor and the Middle East. I just they just finished the debate for If You Want Peace, Forget Justice. This is Stuart Rees and I'm just going to ask you one question. Good. Good. Will history show that Nelson Mandela work was in vain? No, I think he was the greatest proponent of liberation, justice and fairness and indeed of forgiveness that the world has ever known. And uh, he's such an example to everybody, he's such an inspiration to so many people around the world that almost nothing he did was in vain. Not even the 27 years that he spent in prison and certainly not the leadership of a multi uh, cultural South Africa um, after he was released. Thank you very much. Okay. So now we're with Andrea Burbach, Durbach, and my question is to you. Mm -hmm. Is it easier to say if you want peace, forget justice because you're a white woman? Oh, that's a very difficult question, particularly because I come from South, South Africa. Africa. Um, it's not easy to say at all, but I think as a lawyer and also as someone who was from a, the privileged sec section or the privileged part of South Africa, the white community, even though I fought very much against the South African government, mm. um, it's a very difficult thing for me to say, forget justice, um, because I think justice is absolutely crucial to the health of a nation. but. The country that I grew up in was so yearning and so desperate for a peace and for an enduring peace that if it meant that we had to drag people through trials and contests and rake up the past in very public forums where we were making winners and losers of that contest, I still think peace is what I needed to hold on to and aspire towards. So it's definitely not easy for me to say it, particularly as a lawyer, but mm. I think for peace to take hold, one has to let go of the need for justice. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Now we're with Eric Durfman, or Kaufman. Kaufman. And my question is to you, is there any justice for the victims of the Northern Ireland conflict? Um, there isn't justice yet for the victims of the Northern Ireland conflict, to be blunt about it, because the people who perpetrated a lot of the killings have been granted more or less an amnesty as part of the peace process. So at some time in the future, uh, it might take 50 years, it might take 100 years, let us hope that um, the people who represent the same parties that committed the atrocities will issue an apology. But at the present time, I don't think it's practical because it would plunge the peace process. Uh, it would set back the peace process. And right now, it's important for Northern Ireland to have a period of peace so that it can become a stable, prosperous society. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm now with Graham Bellwit. And so, Graham, if you want peace, if, should it be, if you want peace, forget justice? No, clearly not. In my view, you cannot have peace without justice. And uh, the reason I say that is that because people who um, suffer through wars and through conflicts where their relatives have been killed or badly hurt or injured, unless those perpetrators of those crimes are brought to justice, then those people who are surviving feel a sense of injustice. They believe that something should happen to those who cause the misery in their family. And we've seen from time and again that uh, on a big scale, if, that, if there is no uh, justice, then there could be a future war or a future conflict because there was no justice uh, administered in the first conflict. 
So from my point of view, it's essential that if there is a, if there's violence, then someone must be held accountable. There must be justice. Otherwise, you're going to get another cycle of violence after that. And I see that you've got one of those Order for Australia badges. Yes. How did you man? Uh, how did you get one? Yes. That was because of my work investigating war crimes, uh, both from the Second World War, where there were Nazis uh, living here in Australia, and following that, uh, because of my work at the International Tribunal uh, for the former Yugoslavia. So I'd been involved uh, for nearly uh, 20 years in investigating and prosecuting war criminals. And it was because of that work that I got the Order of Australia. And I must say I'm very proud of that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Liam. Stephen Bidip is a psychologist, Father of the Year in 2010, and an author, releasing Manhood, Raising Children, and his new series, Manhood New. You've released 31 um, books in you've released books in 31 different languages and 4 million books in different bookshelves. That's right, but that was over a really long period of time, so that was over 9 million, 29 years. So it wasn't all overnight, yes. My first question is, has your ideology ever been challenged in your own personal life with your children? Okay, well, I don't really have an ideology. An ideology is like a fixed idea of how the world is. And um, I'm much more learned by experience. And, and so if something doesn't work, I usually change it. And um, my wife is really good at helping me to be a better father because she's more of a natural parent. And so I listen to her and I listen to my kids and, I, and, and figure it out and change it quite a lot. Yes, yeah. And are you one of those masked men? Um, no. Um, I had Asperger's syndrome when I was a teenager. And so when you have Asperger's, you have trouble doing a mask. You, you actually have trouble with relationships and knowing what to say. So I sort of um, had to sort of stumble along. And learning to be a psychologist really helped me to get along better with people. And so I had to kind of learn how to be a, a human being one step at a time, whereas most people it sort of comes naturally. Yeah. And were your children your dream children? Um, no one's children are ever their dream children. That's the point of that <laughs> message, that um, the, having kids is to do with throwing out your dream and, and looking who's the real person, because the real person's better than what you would have made up. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your time. That's a pleasure. They were great questions. Thank you. Hi, I'm with Mr Singer. And his topic was Wired for War at the Dangerous Ideas Conference. We've now got his new book, Wired for War. So, my first question is, will there be, would there ever be, um, will the virtual world become our reality? Mm, that's a very good question. I, I think we're using more and more of these technologies, including you see a lot of people, whether it's in war or in gaming or even in commerce, uh, using technologies like Second Life would be an example. Actually, ironically enough, my wife works for the company behind Second Life. But the key, what they're finding, is that they're actually replacing other forms of entertainment and the like. So uh, people the users of Second Life, this virtual world, it's not that they're disengaging from the rest of reality, it's they're substituting the amount of time they spend watching TV or listening to the radio, they're spending in these online platforms. Um, the same thing in war, we're using more and more robotics and the like, but it doesn't mean that the the death side of war, the violence of war is disappearing. It's more that it's a matching element. So you still have soldiers on the ground in Afghanistan, just now they're being supported by a plane overhead that doesn't have a pilot inside of it. The pilot may be somewhere else. So we're seeing great change, but not the end of the human role in any way. Mm. Is the war porn, um, um, is war porn desensitizing people from the horrors of war? I think for some it is, and this name war porn is actually what the soldiers call it. And what they're trying to talk about is that these technologies are recording acts of violence. And for some people, they're, they're seeing these acts of violence, they're seeing these recordings and using it for information, or they're in battle, or they're using it for um, 
documenting the news. But for other people, they're using it for entertainment. They're just watching it for fun. And their worry is that for those that are watching it for fun, you know, treating war as entertainment, for them it is desynthesizing them. And um, I think this is particularly the case um, as we see more and more of our general population that isn't engaged, um, isn't connected to war. You know, a couple generations ago, uh, someone like you or me would know someone in the military, be it ourselves or be it our brothers or fathers. And now we're seeing a very small percentage of our population is actually connected to the military anymore. And so the problem is that they won't know uh, what um, what the reality of war is. Their only engagement will be this, this virtual form. Um, would robotic technology be less effective in a war fought on American soil? Well, what's happening is that um, with this remote warfare, you have people that are at war, but not in the physical battle space. So you have a battle that may be happening in Afghanistan, but the pilots are sitting, uh, for example, in the U.S. Air Force at Creech Air Force Base, which is right outside Las Vegas in Nevada. Um, this is the same for other militaries as well. Uh, for example, the British Royal Air Force flies one of these squadrons of drones, Reaper drones is what they call them. Mm -hmm. That squadron, the drones are over Afghanistan. The British pilots actually are also just outside Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, who would have imagined this was the world that we're entering into? To take this to the next level, the Australian military recently just signed a contract with an Israeli company to support the troops, uh, the Australian troops in Afghanistan. The Israelis will help fly the planes. So it's not just the normal mode of um, where a country buys airplanes from somewhere else. It's now buying the services of the pilots to fly them. This is a very 21st century setup mm. that, that our understanding of war really has a hard time of dealing with, but it's the reality. Mm. Does, the technology blur, does this technology blur what is real? Who is the droid? the robot or the person? I think the, the concern that some people have is when they're watching uh, a, a target, when they're watching an enemy and they're just seeing it through the screen, that sometimes this distance and effect may, may make it easier to kill. Um, in the book, I did an interview with a actually a U.S. Green Beret, one of our special forces. He was a sniper. And he actually was very concerned about this because he said anything that um, makes it easier to kill is not a good thing. Where they really get concerned is what happens is you have a generation that's grown up playing video games, now operating a system that has the same controller as a video game, you're watching it through a screen, so the experience is much like a video game, um, does it make it harder for them to distinguish? And there's a quote in the book, I was talking with the, um, he worked at a, a military robotics company, and he said, um, I worry about having a generation of kids who grew up playing Grand Theft Auto and handing them controls of something that really can't kill. Mm -hmm. That's their concern. And that means because of that, we have to pay more and more attention to um, making sure people get the reality of it, making sure they, they are well trained, making sure we have the laws to deal with all of this. So, also, what warfare technology also benefits civilian lives, such as people with disabilities? Why does it take war to understand a person with a disability? It's a great, great question, and then we see this again and again with technology, where things that were invented in war move over to the civilian side. Um, we see this, for example, the, the classic example is the Internet. Uh, the Internet was originally designed by the U.S. military for use in the event of a nuclear war to help them communicate if, if all the systems broke down. We now use it for everything from... We use it to communicate, we use it to play video games, we use it to, to buy airplane tickets. Mm. Um, and we're seeing the same thing with this robotics technology, uh, where, for example, um, they've used it uh, for things like law enforcement, to things like they're using drones to hunt for sharks off of beaches, uh, to they're using it for medicine, um, robotic surgery, where you may have someone in a country like... Um, the Congo or uh, um, 
uh, Indonesia who can't get good medical care, but because of a remote operation, a highly skilled surgeon, say in Sydney, can be carrying out surgery on that person thousands of miles away. So incredible, incredible advancement. Mm. And, and to me, it just is a good illustration that um, we sometimes want to talk about technology be as being good or technology as being bad, when really technology, at the end of the day, it's a machine. It, it's not ethical. It's how we use it that's ethical. Do we use mm. it for good? Do we use it for bad? Uh, and that s means that it steers so much of the discussion about the technology, it really should be about us. And my final question is, has this technology been developed as a result of the United States' inability to deal with terrorism? Well, what's happening is um, what they call battles of asymmetry. That is, you have two sides that it used to be the two sides would meet in battle and they'd fight on the same place. Uh, and that was true whether we were talking about the knights back in the Middle Ages or we saw this in the, the first uh, Persian Gulf War where the two militaries faced each other. Well, now we have asymmetries where those that are fighting against the U.S. or fighting against Australia or Great Britain, um, they're not facing them in the battlefield uh, there's, because for them it's almost suicidal. Um, mm. And so their response is to turn to things like terrorism or insurgency. We're not going to fight your soldiers directly, so we're going to go at them indirectly mm. with these things like roadside bombs. So then what's the U.S. and Australia and others are responding with their own technologic asymmetry. They're saying, fine, you're going to do roadside bombs. We're going to invent robotics that will go out and defuse that roadside bomb rather than a soldier having to do it. Well, what happens next? The other side responds with its asymmetry. So we've seen um, uh, terrorists and insurgents design ambushes specifically for robots. We've seen targeting against the homeland because of this. Uh, the um, terrorist who, who sought to blow himself up in Times Square in New York a couple months ago. He said he did this because of the drones. And so what's happening is a constant back and forth and back and forth. In this case, not on the battlefield, but in these asymmetries. Thank you for your time, Mr. Singer. Thank you. It's been great talking to you. Great. I'm Liam Neer from CKTV. I hope you enjoyed the Dangerous Ideas Festival for 2010.